Hey, uh, I want to welcome everybody. I'm uh, Ed Walton, CEO of Step CG. We're broadcasting today from our Innovation Bourbon Bar in Covington, Kentucky. Step CG is a fast-growing IT solution provider, managed service provider, and today we're going to talk about two of our favorite subjects, bourbon and security, which uh, go hand in hand. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit, of it. I'll kick this off, I'm going to hand off to Brian from uh, our friends at Fortinet, uh, leader in, in actually redefining network security. We're glad to be partnered with them, fast-growing partnership for us. And then we're going to do some bourbon tasting with Andrew. Andrew, where are you uh, actually physically located? I'm uh, located in Waco, Texas. So I'm halfway between Dallas and Austin. Okay. All right. Well, let's do a little bourbon trivia. Who found, who, well, first, let's start with whiskey. Does everybody know the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Tennessee. Tennessee. Holy moly, you're in Kentucky. Guys. <laughs> 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 you guys from Chicago. So every bourbon is a whiskey, but not every whiskey is a bourbon. You know why? Is that like a percentage of yeah. wheat or something? Like 51% corn mash. Anything else? Has to be aged in <laughs> barrel, barrel, barrel. Alcohol content has to be alcohol content has to be 86. Can't enter anything more than 125 proof when it goes into the barrel. 95% of the bourbon in the world is produced here in Kentucky. This is Kentucky is the bourbon capital of the world. Bardstown actually is bourbon capital. We have 73 distilleries in Kentucky. We actually have two barrels of bourbon for every uh, person in Kentucky, if you will. And do you know who was the first guy who invented bourbon? Start Googling here. You guys got to go <laughs> 1789, Georgetown, Kentucky, Elijah Craig. Oh. No. Have you had Elijah Craig before? Yeah. Okay. He was a Baptist minister. Think about that. <laughs> Intersection of the Bible Belt with spirits. So anyway, we're going to kick this off. Uh, you know, it's a crazy world. we got pandemics. we got supply chain stuff. Might even be a war going on. But network security has never been more present for organizations and companies. The attack surface is growing, uh, you know, the risk is always getting greater. And what we're going to talk about today and what Brian's going to overview is really kind of a, a new way of thinking of things, really operationalizing how you manage security and risk with the Fortinet security fabric. And what we do here at STEP is we're very, very good at building out the most complex network infrastructure, wired, wireless, NAC. And then we do very we do a lot with uh, cellular, all things 5G, private cellular, 4G, IoT, mobile branch. But everything has to be wrapped with security. So we offer all this from STEP, and we only choose best and breed partners. And that's why we have the market leader in security and other technologies talking today with Fortinet. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Brian, and then uh, after that, we'll do some bourbon tasting. All right, uh, let me start my prezo here. So give me one second, it popped up. Uh, uh, appreciate everyone uh, joining today. Hopefully it's it's me that you came for instead of the bourbon, but I, I'm, I'm gonna think that, but I know that's probably not true. So thanks to FCG for, for hosting this. I, I believe it's gonna be a, a great uh, event. And like you said, we've got um, a lot of things on our minds with everything going on in the world and uh, you know, Ed said, you know, IT security is at uh, a peak right now with everything going on. So I uh, wanted to just do a little introduction into um, who Fortinet is and uh, kind of give you guys an idea of what's the mission that Fortinet set uh, to do originally 20 years ago. And then as security evolved and the uh, issues of IT security uh, shortages of, of personnel and then as well as complex how complex uh, IT security has gotten, kind of what we started uh, going on about seven years ago now in the mid to, to, to late 2015. So if you have any questions, this is uh, your time. So anybody in uh, virtual or in the room, please uh, interrupt. I, I have a few slides. I, I don't want to go too deep into a bunch of PowerPoint slides, but 
Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them into the question or chat window and we'll get those addressed. So um, if you have not un uh, heard who Fortinet is, uh, there are hundreds, if not even uh, uh, in getting close to a thousand, I'll call it new security companies that cropped up over the last five to six years. Fortinet is not one of those. Um, Fortinet is going on 20 years. They were uh, started back in 20, 2000, 2001. And actually, if you've been around the industry for a while and you know of NetScreen, NetScreen was kind of the, the, the pre-product of the FortiGate, which is Fortinet's flagship product. So uh, very seasoned company, 20 plus years. Uh, Four billion uh, in billings over 2021, um, 50 plus products. So when you look at the uh, landscape out there, the industry, you really have a few companies that have uh, a suite of products, a, a plethora of products. But uh, when it comes down to having that 25 plus products in almost every facet of a network, it's going to be Fortinet and Cisco that are going to be filling those slots when it comes across that broad, uh, solid set of solutions. So um, bottom right there, you'll see that ASICs. That was really the mission that Kenzie started off with was he understood that in order to get the most out of a security product, you had to be able to process the uh, the data that you were getting and you had to be able to do that quickly. So as fast as your network is going, you cannot take a hit to slow that down to inspect that or else what are people are going to do, they're going to turn that security off or complain about it. So we started the very first product that Fortinet created back in the early 2000s was actually a ASIC uh, silico chip that is purpose built by Fortinet. We do not OEM this from anybody, nor do we OEM it out to anybody that is specifically built to handle the types of traffic that you need to inspect across your network. You can see here uh, the two things I want to point out. I've been here for six years. When I started, I think we were at about 4,000 employees. We are now cresting 10,000, and that's probably going to grow by another 20 to 25 percent in the next few years. But the bigger point is the, the customers worldwide, 565,000 customers worldwide. A lot of importance to that because when we've got a security appliance out there and we Fortinet is the most deployed security appliance from any company globally, but those are sensors. So what that means to uh, any customer of Fortinet and quite honestly with the initiatives that we have, if you go back 12 years or so, even more, it was always a security company A versus a security company B and I'll, I'll pick on McAfee and Symantec just to because they were the ones that, but you had an endpoint security back then, and it was always okay. I got to have McAfee because they caught these things, right? I had Symantec because they caught these things. Whenever those companies would find something, they would keep it to themselves, and that would be a differentiator for uh, their customers. That is not the case. It is now a IT security uh, vendor versus the hackers. So. Uh, we do share the content amongst all of our competitors. There's a whole bunch of, uh, we'll talk about or show a slide here with a couple things here, but there are foundations that were started by Fortinet and the competition that our competitors to share that data. But when you talk about these 565,000 customers, these are, are uh, sensors out in the world that if something were to crop up in a network in some part of, of Europe or some other part of Asia pack, uh, that data is, is being, um, churn through out in that customer's site through a FortiGate or even through a competitor. And then that information, if it's from a FortiGate, is being sent up to FortiGuard Labs. And I'll talk about FortiGuard Labs. But having those 5 million plus sensors out there give us a ton of data. You can have the best, fast, fastest products in the world, but unless you can identify malicious activity and react to it, your product's just a fast packet pusher. So you really want to be able to have that information and then put a lot of effort into that what we call FortiGuard Labs to sift through that data and make sure that you are uh, dissecting that information and making sure that it is, uh, if it's malicious, you're blocking it. If it's not malicious, you're allowing it. Another big key to Fortinet is uh, very proud of is the 1,255 patents globally. Again, when I started, it was just under 500. So this current CEO is an engineer at heart. Everything he does is to 
do something that I don't like to say it's patentable, but do something that's different, unique, that is making a difference in the landscape. So uh, when we do that, we file for patent, and there are a lot of things that uh, are used from our competition as well, but just in the industry that is uh, back ended in through a Fortinet patent. One of those things, and this is a key, it actually won product of the year from a channel uh, uh, magazine uh, back in 2016, is the Fortinet security fabric. So the ironic thing about this is, is it's not actually a product, it's really an architecture. So everybody, no matter what they're doing in their network, has a fabric. Everyone's got point products to cover their endpoint security, their network security, IPS, uh, whatever that might be. So what Fortinet set out to do, again, starting about seven years ago, was knowing the shortage and how much uh, alert fatigue there is out there, you could get uh, a bunch of alerts from your endpoint product that will correlate with your network security or your firewall or some other aspect of your email, whatever it might be. Those IT admins have to go in and figure out, is this duplicate alerts? Is one causing the other? And that uh, takes up a lot of time as well as causes things to either be overlooked or not looked at at all. Um, so uh, the Fortinet security fabric was an initiative to try to stitch those things together and make sure that there's synergy across these different vectors that are working together so that the IT teams do not have to do that initial triage. They're looking at these product sets and saying, hey, I know that this Email came in, it hit the endpoint, it infected that endpoint, the network uh, firewall stopped that, whatever it might be, or it allowed it. And now I have these 50 alerts coming up that there's something going on in these places, but all I have to worry about is how to stop that endpoint or how to squash that email from being propagated throughout the rest of the environment. So that is really the basis of what the security fabric is doing. I'll get into a little bit more on that uh, uh, in a second here and how that actually works. So. Leading into that is the Fortinet technology vision. You can see here it's, uh, again, many, I'll call them vectors, point products. you got many ways of getting access to your network as well as exiting your network. So uh, there's a product portfolio of 50 plus products within Forta, and that's where we kind of fell short is our naming of, of everything as you, you look at anything and it's Forta something and Forta Mail is obviously email. Uh, Forta Web is a, is a web uh uh, web app firewall uh, for the CASB, and anyone can guess that's a CASB product. So we do have uh, uh, coverage for a ton of different vectors and, and things that stitch together to give you that holistic one-stop, uh, well, not even want to say one-stop shop, but just that overall view of your complete network so that you have that ability to stitch all those products together without any real heavy complications or heavy lifting. We look at that going out to the cloud. So there's also uh, the whole cloud from, from the applications out there with SaaS uh, and network as a, store, uh, as a service, things like that. So um, a lot of those uh, technologies, if, if you're into moving to the cloud, uh, no one's gonna be completely over to the cloud. It's gonna be a hybrid situation. So that's where having some on-prem as well as some cloud uh, aspects of your security and your network are beneficial with having some some system that can make sure that those are stitched together and know of each other and how they're working together. Uh, Ordinate is very strong in making sure that our products are uh, tested and that they do what they say they're going to do. Again, Ken Z, the, the founder, being an engineer mind, it's not, uh, it's not good enough that it just says it does it. It has to actually live up to what we say it does. So always uh, uh, gaining ground in, in Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, network firewalls, the FortiGate uh, itself has been in that get a Magic Quadrant for a uh, dozen plus years. And then as the other products mature, um, and the, actually these some of these categories in Gartner have just been created along the way with, you know, EDR, XDR. Some of these things weren't even really a uh, product set five years ago. Um, we are uh, in those magic quadrants as well. Uh, NSS Labs was heavy because NSS Labs, which dissolved right around the beginning of COVID, was a good uh, a group of, of engineers that really taxed these products and then gave their, their the, the facts or their results around how those products did against whatever they threw at it. 
Uh, we don't list them up here anymore, but uh, if you look at NSS Labs, uh, we were always high up in, in those uh, testing that they did. So I talked about this earlier, most deployed firewall in the world. You can see over the course of the years, uh, we've gained ground and separated uh, from our competition in that area. Again, what that really means comes down to the next uh, couple slides here. So the ASIC advantage, why Fortinet can do what we do. The, the FortiGate itself being our flagship product, um, if you notice, it's not called the Forta Firewall. So even though I, uh, before I started here, a couple of weeks before I started at Fortinet, um, I knew of Fortinet, but I just thought, oh, they're this uh, firewall company. It's way more than just a firewall company. That FortiGate uh, is purpose built with a, a, a network processor and a content processor that we build in house. So it gives that appliance or uh, we've got some in the cloud, but it gives that appliance the ability to get 9x the industry average when it comes to SSL decryption. So when you look at trying to secure a network, everything has gone towards being encrypted from endpoint to cloud. If a firewall is sitting in between that, you got to be able to do that inspection somehow. Uh, having a purpose-built ASIC to, to decrypt that traffic wire speed gives a huge advantage to the customer because now they can see what's going on in that stream. Um, 85, we did a test the other day for a, a customer, uh, we call them CTAPs, um, but it's kind of a go in and check their, their environment to see what their current solutions are doing or missing. And we found that 85% of that customer's network traffic was uh, encrypted in SSL. Um, so having these ASICs helps with that if you needed to do deep packet inspection into that. Uh, doing um, other things, these ASICs help with uh, network security, um, or I'm sorry, network passing when you're doing um, any kind of BGP or anything like that. So the ASICs are a huge advantage. And quite honestly, it gives the ability for us to give the performance of what our competition needs to be up in a higher model, we can do in a mid to low model, and then our higher models are several X more than what their high, high models can do. So uh, a lot of the reason why we have that penetration into the uh, global uh, uh, environments is because of what we can give our customers with those lower end appliances. So I spoke a lot about Fortinet and the security fabric. We realize and we do not expect any customer, we don't expect a partner to go in and say, hey, rip everything out and put four to everything in there. Obviously, that would be great if they did, but we know that the sales cycle doesn't work that way. And quite honestly, that's not the best for the customer. The best thing for the customer is to have an open ecosystem that Fortinet heads up. We call it the partner program, fabric partner program, where we have 480 other companies, you see some logos up there. Some of them are foe, some of them are friend, but we do have uh, some of, of, of our competition and where we uh, fit as part of this uh, open ecosystem that we have integrations into those products so that you can get as good of a visibility into your environment, whether you've got the Forda product in there or the competition, the integration between those. And that ranges anywhere from just a white paper, how to integrate that through APIs or through certain log systems that collect the logs, all the way up through having these fabric connectors inside the, the GUI where you just click security fabric, fabric connector, pick the, the solution that you're using, usually ask for some kind of login or something to connect those two together. And now you're uh, gathering that data and being able to, in some cases, even remediate. So you can block anything that's going on that might be spreading throughout that, depending on the integration that we've got with that product. So uh, not meant to be something that is a rip and replace. That is, uh, I wanna stress that a lot because there's several reasons for that. One, it's, it's not the best for the customer, but also um, even though I'll, I'll say it, some people might cringe here, uh, Fortinet has great products. We all realize not every product is the right fit for that customer. Depending on what they're doing, our product might be the best fit, but then again, it might not. So if there's a 
specific situation that they need to use one of these other products, it'd be better to get that integration between them than to have to force them to maybe lose some functionality or change what they're doing in order to gain this. So uh, very heavy on making sure that this ecosystem is open so that it's it's across the whole uh, environment and we're welcoming new fabric partners all the time. Last thing, and I don't know how I'm doing on time here. I haven't been really watching, but I think we're good here before we get to the bourbon and, and Andrew. Um, but again, I mentioned it uh, at the heart of everything that we do is FortiGuard Labs. If we have the fastest firewall in the world, it makes no difference if we're letting everything in. All we're doing is letting in faster. So, uh, so FortiGuard Labs uh, takes a lot of our um, R&D budget. We view that as something that is super important. A lot of those patents, the 1200 plus patents, came out of the tool sets that FortiGuard Labs uses to digest the petabytes of data that we're getting from our 565 million customers worldwide. So uh, AI uh, product that we released uh, last year was a product in development for FortiGuard Labs for over a decade. And once it got mature and uh, was able to do the benefit that it had for FortiGuard Labs. Um, they wrapped a UI on it, and quite honestly, we can bring FortiGuard Labs down into a customer's environment through uh, NDX is what we call it. But uh, AI, so there's a lot of content, or a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, good, uh, I'll call data sets or anything coming out of FortiGuard Labs and how they digest and make sure that we are getting those malicious tidbits of information down to our customer to protect them as fast as possible. I talked about the uh, Cyber Threat Alliance. So these are some of the actual information that FortiGuard Labs takes uh, uh, part in. Interpol, NCI, AG, Agency, World Economic Forum. So knowing that we've got this great FortiGuard Labs and we can take this data and make sure that the world is, is benefiting from it, uh, we, we do make sure that we either uh, partake or found uh, find, found uh, certain things like the Cyber Threat Alliance so that we're, if there's a missing piece where we feel there could be a benefit, we take the, the reins and start to start that process so that uh, the world benefits from it. That's really, I believe the, the, the slides that I had, ran through that fairly quickly. I don't know, did any questions come up on the? I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, but if yeah, there's yeah. a, a Q&A, just for Yeah, there is a Q&A if you have any questions. I don't know if anybody in the room has any questions. If not, I'll pause for 10 seconds to, to give people time to type those in. But if, uh, after that, if there's no questions, we'll pass it on to Andrew for the, the important part of this. So we didn't have to drink every time we said Ford up. <laughs> you guys be hammered. <laughs> wait, was anyone else? Wait, was no one else doing that? <laughs> self report. <laughs> well, we do have a lot of port of bourbon. Yeah, there's bourbon to be drank. So uh, I don't know if you want to switch over to Andrew. I appreciate everybody's time. And uh, oh, for that, I'll be here to answer wait, questions. You got a question? Okay. Well, I'll just a comment. Yes. Um, I've been in the industry for like 20 years uh, and just getting exposed to Fortinet in the past like six months, seriously. Um, like, been impressed. Like, all the marketing, the solution, the technology. To your same point, like, oh, firewall, firewall, right. firewall. But, uh, like, I, like, you guys are on the precipice of being an overnight success after 20 years, right? Like, it's, it's a very broad portfolio. Like, it's you guys in Cisco. Yeah, um, it's, and it's, it's impressive. And that really was the reason I came to Fortinet. I wasn't looking. I, I, someone approached me and I was like, eh, it's a firewall company. It's, it's kind of run its course, right? A firewall is a firewall. And I saw the demo and at the time it was just budding. That Fortinet security fabric was budding. And I'm like, man, they're really on to something here. And it's, uh, I don't, uh, there's no one here that I, but I, I gave it to a couple guys over the course of the years. It's kind of the demo of like, hey, same thing. They're sitting there, well, you guys are firewall. Well, we're more than that, let me show you. And I pop in and show them a demo, and I pull up this screen, we call it the physical topology, and it's a fishbone view of your environment. And it's got the FortiGate, that's the network, it's got cloud, you've got cloud out there, all the way down, your switches, access point, endpoint, endpoints, 
and I could tell you the phone number of the person sitting in, what box they're on, and what their ID is for either Google or any of the social media platforms, and then it pulls their avatar in for that too. So um, it's one of these things where uh, almost everybody that we show, customers and and uh, and partners, they look at this for the first time and they're like, wait, this is something that I thought people were trying to get to, but I didn't realize someone actually built this and this is actually working. Like this is light years ahead of what I've ever seen. So it's pretty impressive. If anybody wants to follow up, get in touch with Step CG a counterpart that you know, we'll get you a, a 20 minute. We can poke in and just show you this is the a teaser of what we can do. So we'll we'll send out the deck, right? Following this. We can, and, yeah. And we send out contact info, follow up for a follow on meeting or discussion. Absolutely. And or if you'd like to visit the Innovation Burden Bar, it's open 7x24. This is the only bar that's been open the entire pandemic, by the way. <laughs> Definitely in social distance and so forth. Uh, do we want to go to Andrew if there's any other questions? That was great, Brian. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, perfect. Well, we're going to get to get to maybe not the most fun part of the meeting, but maybe the most fun, fun part of the meeting. Let's get into taste through some whiskey. Um, my name is Andrew Anderson. I am one of the blenders here at Bob Cummings Distilling. We're located in Waco, Texas. Uh, we do make bourbon, but our main focus here is making uh, single malt whiskey, specifically American single malts. Um, so that being said, we're going to be having a really fun whiskey and nuts and chocolate caramel tasting today. Uh, and feel free, like by all means, like if you guys want to go off mute, I would love for this to be more of like an open dialogue conversation to where like we can ask questions, kind of talk about the whiskeys that we're trying, kind of talk about the pairings. Uh, but if you guys would much prefer to type things in chat, by all means, feel free to do so. Um, the whole point is for this to be engaging and for people to be interacting and having fun. Um, the whole idea of this is to be kind of like a pseudo blind tasting. So we'll kind of like ideally taste through the three whiskeys that were provided. Hopefully no one like peeped inside the bags. Uh, and then you can kind of go through it a couple different ways. You can kind of like taste through the whiskeys and then do whiskey and the nuts together and then with the chocolate afterwards. Or you can kind of do like one whiskey, then the whiskey with the nuts, then the whiskey with the chocolate. Or you, if you're more of like a like a sweet tooth kind of person, you can do whiskey first and then the chocolate caramel and the nuts afterwards. So there's no right or wrong. Uh, the whole point of this is to be a sensory experience and for us to have fun and to kind of see like how different things can play, like different food items can play with the spirits. Um, but as was mentioned, uh, not all whiskeys are bourbons, but all bourbons are whiskey. And with that being said, we have a few different options or a few different uh, variances of whiskey that we're gonna be trying today. And as everyone kind of like, and feel free, like if you haven't already poured up your glasses, Go ahead and do so. I'll kind of have like a little like preamble as far as the presentation. And the first thing that you're going to want to do with a glass of whiskey, just like if you've done a beer or a wine tasting before, is the first thing you want to do is you're going to nose the spirit. Um, due to the fact that whiskey has significantly higher amounts of alcohol than what you're going to find in a beer or a glass of wine, you're not going to want to breathe in quite as deeply. So a helpful little hint, and I'll just kind of uh, instruct this for you guys, or kind of like go through this with you guys, is to kind of bring the glass to your nose. And once you start getting this like ethanol, this kind of like sharpness from the spirit, that means your nose is a little bit too close. So like somewhere around, so I'm going to like try to do it from the side so you guys can see a little bit better. Uh, this is probably going to be a little bit too close. So if you're lip is touching the glass this means you're probably a little bit too close and so just kind of pull back a little bit you'll kind of find this like sweet spot and just kind of take a second to kind of like process the aromas that you're smelling because so much of what we taste is actually what we smell 
uh, not only just like in smelling and nosing the spirit, but even in this interaction that's called virtual nasal olfaction. And that's where once you take a sip of spirit or any kind of alcoholic beverage of any kind, uh, this virtual nasal olfaction, this kind of like lingering flavor that's kind of sitting in your throat, will work back up into your nasal cavity. And that's what's giving you the complexity of flavor. Because uh, your tongue can only taste the basic uh, sensory perceptions of like sour, sweet, bitter, umami, uh, depending on who you ask, like fattiness may be actually one of the newer ones that we're going to be allowing to the lexicon. Um, but that being said, like, feel free to dig into the first one. I'd love to get some feedback as far as like uh, the nose. And one thing to kind of think about is like the nose, the palate, like, the tasting notes and the finish is like, it's all subjective and there's no right or wrong. So like if you're smelling or tasting different things than what is listed on that sheet, don't think that you're wrong. Um, those are more, just like call on like pleasant guidelines, kind of like directing you in a certain direction in case you can't really figure out what you're smelling and tasting. Uh, it's like something to kind of like tie the room together. Um, I would love, as people are digging into it, like if there's anything like on the nose or on the palate or the finish that uh, that kind of stands out to them, like that may resonate a little bit. I would love to hear that and just kind of like, or if y'all have any questions about whiskey in general, so on and so forth, I would love to hear that input as well. Because, like, me personally, I definitely get, like, a lot of, like, the wheat. Um, and we'll kind of, like, just uh, unveil what the different whiskeys are at the end of everything. Well, I guess unless you guys peek in the bag first. Um, but I definitely get, like, that weedy kind of characteristic to it on the nose. Um, I've been doing, like, a lot of talking. I haven't even actually tasted any of the whiskey yet. So, to be criminal, I guess you shouldn't trust anybody that won't drink whiskey that's in front of them. So... Yeah, I definitely get like a lot of really cool like caramel, like a lot of like sweetness to it. Um, even like some like cool like stone fruit characteristics. I'm curious if anyone wants to throw in the chat. Um, anything is like jumping out to them, like whether it's like on the sheet or inadvertently like something off the sheet that they're picking up that's not necessarily descriptive. Uh, I would love to see that as well for sure. And just kind of take your time with it. Like, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, everything, like, taste and smell is subjective. So there's no right or wrong answer. So, like, don't be afraid to chime in. Um, as you guys are, like, processing the first one, the next one we're going to be going into is a pretty fun bourbon. Um, so I know that you kind of mentioned, like, not all whiskeys are or all bourbons are whiskeys, but not all whiskeys are bourbon. And it's a really interesting thing because like also in the world of bourbon, there are different styles of bourbon. You know, you have like high wheat bourbons, you have high rye bourbons, you have uh, high malt bourbons. So like there's a lot of different variances or like kind of like subcategories in the world of whiskey and specifically bourbon. And that's kind of like a really great way to kind of think about it is like kind of think of like whiskey as like music to where it's like this like overarching like definition of uh, not to so like oversell what we do too much, but like an art style. Um, but just like within music, you have different like genres and like subgenres. And that's really kind of like what we're living in in this spectrum of like different whiskeys that we're trying today. Um, and if you guys want to, by all means, feel free to try the nuts and the chocolate between the tastings. Like, personally, myself, I'm going to be waiting till the end once I've tasted the whiskeys and then kind of seeing. Because, personally speaking, I feel like it's a really great way to kind of see, like, how the whiskeys compare one to another. And then also, like, revisiting those whiskeys and then seeing how they pair with the nuts and the chocolate. And so, like... 
don't think take that as like a definitive answer. Um, but yeah, just kind of like have fun with it. I mean, the whole point of this is to uh, taste different spirits, try something that's like fun, and see like this like sensory experience that you wouldn't necessarily, depending on the person, you wouldn't necessarily seek out. Um, but I would love to hear anybody that has any like suggestions or like notes on the first whiskey or on the second whiskey that we're trying right now. Any kind of uh, any notes that they're picking up on that was like listed or something that wasn't listed that they would like to chime in on. I would love to hear it. And by all means, also like feel free to type it in chat as well. Also, like, preferences are, like, totally encouraged. So if you guys, like, one, two, or three more, by all means, like, feel free to throw those in the chat as well. What about you, Zach? What, uh, do you have a preference between number one and number two so far? I th Oh, yeah. Can you hear us, Andrew? Yes, so I am. Everyone's still stuck on number one over here in, in the in the bourbon bar. <laughs> but we're getting there. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Yeah. What are you all? What are your What are your thoughts on number one so far, though? Like, are there any notes that are sticking out to you, like from the sheet? Well, they're standing out, or is there anything like outside of like the realm of like? What you're smelling and tasting with Blitzed that you want to share with the group? Bagers is a crowd favorite over here in general. So, I mean, that's like fair. It's, it's a good one. It's kind of hard to beat. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. It's like a fun thing too, because like we have like a pretty wide spectrum spectrum of different whiskeys, even though they're all bourbons. Um, we have like the first whiskey, without like divulging too many secrets, uh, is a high wheat bourbon, which means that even though it's predominantly corn, which is required by law, which uh, the gentleman at the beginning of the seminar had mentioned, that must be at least fifty one percent corn. Uh, the first one has a really good amount of wheat in it. Uh, kind of like as we are progressing through the tasting, it's going to be increasing in rye content. So that's when you're going to start getting these more kind of like minty, menthol-y kind of characteristics. Uh, sometimes it can be even really like a little bit spicy. Uh, not necessarily like spicy in the sense of like peppers, but more of a spicy in the sense of kind of like baking spices. And so it's a really cool way to kind of see, like, even though it's a certain style of whiskey, that there are these, like, subcategories and, like, these, like, uh, realms that they live in that different whiskeys can, even though it's the same style, can have, like, a really dramatic and different uh, presentation to how they actually smell and taste. Um, but that being said, is anyone gotten so far as to do any pairing yet to kind of see like how like the first whiskey smells and tastes compared with tasting like nuts and chocolate or y'all just going through and doing everything individually and then revisiting them afterwards kind of curious like y'all's uh y'all's approach to it All right, everyone's getting their taste of number two in, so I think I think we're ready to move to number three. Do y'all have a do y'all have a preference? Just on like it's called like a professional curiosity. Do y'all have a preference between number one and number two? Number one and number two. What's the vote? Two. 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 Thank you. Nice. Two. Two. Two's the winner in our house. Interesting. <laughs> Very cool. 
Uh, so the last one we're going to be trying is a high rye bourbon. And what that means is that there is a pretty good amount of rye grain in the mash bill. Um, so you see, like, this is, and this is going to be, like, subjective, but some, like, it may be, like, a little bit, like, thinner body. It may not be quite as, like, viscous as the first two whiskeys were. Uh, it also may be a little bit more herbaceous. And it's funny because this is actually a whiskey that's not produced by the same distillery. And what I mean by that is that even though a whiskey can, or a distillery can release whiskey, they don't necessarily have to make it. Um, so there's a difference between produced whiskey and sourced whiskey. There's also a really interesting thing to think of. Um, I guess I, maybe I shouldn't divulge this information starting out because it may give you guys like some preconceived notions. Um, but it's a really cool way to kind of see like how people can make really great whiskey or release really great whiskey and not necessarily make it themselves. Uh, so it's also some, something to think of too. And kind of like as you guys are tasting through the third one, a really fun thing to kind of think of or just like to kind of like take as like this anecdotal information is that unless a whiskey says that it's distilled and followed by that distillery, that whiskey is likely sourced, which is not a bad thing. But as a consumer, it's something that you should be aware of and that you should know. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious and like as you guys are like revisiting and trying it with the nuts and the chocolate, uh, I would definitely love to kind of see like maybe if the pairings weigh in on your preferences a little bit. Um, we yeah, had just like general curiosity, kind of like how's the sensory experience going for you guys? Is uh, is number two still the favorite? Are we? Did anybody like switch and jump ships number three to their favorite? So what's the verdict? I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> That's fair. It's Everyone's not like drinking, hanging out, having fun, yeah. So we're we have a mix between two and three right now. We're we're mixed between two and three. Interesting. Have y'all uh have you done any like the pairings yet? Or are y'all just doing just purely like sensory like the whiskey so far? They're just doing the pure whiskey so far. Nice, cool. I would love to like see like what the perception of it, perception of the spirits are, like after the pairings and everything. I think it might be interesting to kind of see like what the differences are and like maybe like between like two and three, uh, if they have any preferences after the tasting that they may not have uh, seen before. I think it'd be really fun, really cool. Awesome. I'm going to get that feedback for you. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I'll hold you to it. Uh, with that being said, is, uh, while we're kind of like chasing through things and experiencing, does anybody have any questions they want to throw into the chat or come off mute and, uh, we can like dialogue and like taste through and taste through some whiskey and kind of experience like different sensory experiences or just like random whiskey questions that, uh, they may not like ask in a normal setting, but we're also in a safe space. So, by all means, feel free to voice any, like, curiosities that you have about the spirits. I would love to uh, answer those questions for you guys. So it's a verdict. Fantastic. Well, hey, we want to thank everybody for joining today. We'd like to 
continue the conversation. We'll send out the deck and contact info and certainly either virtually or here in person in the Innovation Center at uh, Step CG. So, hey, Andrew, great job. And thank you, Brian, as well for the presentation. And thank you all for attending today. Yeah, what, thank you guys so much. Three? Three. I think three is the winner. Three is the winner? No, no way. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Wait, is that chasing or no chasing? Or is uh, pairing I don't think or no pairing? Chasing is here. Or pairs. We well, just go straight for it. Respect, <laughs> I respect I respect your uh, your enthusiasm. I love it. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, thanks so much guys. Y'all be well. Take care. Awesome.